Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the Hunt the Wild podcast. I'm your host, Adam Bolds, and today I'm joined with Troy Pottinger. Uh, Troy is an Idaho native, and he's a whitetail addict, addict and a mountain man. How you doing, Troy? Good, Adam. Uh, good to be here. Yeah, I, I really appreciate you taking the, the time to come on. I'm If people not watching on YouTube, I'm looking at Troy's background right now, and I'm amazed at all these bucks on the wall. Um, could you tell everybody kind of who you are and where you're from and just give a little background for somebody that's never heard of you? Absolutely. I'm a, a lifelong uh, native Idahoan. I was born and raised in northern Idaho, which is up in the panhandle, kind of by Canada. Uh, I got Montana on one side of me and Washington on the other. And I live in the kind of a pretty cool area, a heart of uh elk country and mule deer and big whitetails too, believe it or not, uh, mountain bucks. And, uh, I've spent a lot of years of my life as a educator. I uh, um, got a kinesiology and biology background. Uh, I currently teach in Pulse Falls, Idaho. And then I've, I also grew up, my dad was a logger and I grew up uh, logging with my father. So for the last 30 years, I've also had my own construction slash logging business that I run when I'm not teaching. And of course, uh, whitetails are, are, is where I spend all the rest of my time outside <laughs> of my fa- outside of my family. The, the whitetails have me. I, I spend a lot of time at them. Yeah. So I kind of want to just dive right into it because I know you're very knowledgeable. Your walls show it and everything I've read and heard, heard you on other podcasts and everything, you know, a lot when you're, picking a piece of public, which you hunt like all public, right? How do you, uh, how do you pick the right piece to hunt? Like, how do you, how do you just know, like, that's where I'm going? Is there like some kind of secret or something? You know, I don't, I don't ever, I don't think it's a secret. It's just, you know, I've put in decades and, uh, I've been hunting for 40 years. Um, and, I, I am blessed to have quite a bit of public land out here, but it is vast. Uh, it's, it's literally hard to explain unless you come out here. The, the country is, you know, we got, I've got mountains that run up to 10, 12,000 feet in the state of Idaho and, and uh, between that Montana and Washington and literally millions of acres of public ground between the three states that I hunt. I'm in the panhandle, so a very narrow strip of northern Idaho right up by Canada, and it's real easy for me to jump in all three states. Um, so to, to take a giant piece of access on, in rugged, steep, huge terrain, uh, timber-covered, literally hundreds of miles of timber up here on the mountains, uh, contour, topography, change from 1,500 feet elevation to eight or 9,000, uh, you're really talking about big, 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 true. Like when you hear the word big country, this is big country, (laughs) as big as it gets. (laughs) It's as big as it gets, in my opinion, for whitetail hunting. I don't think there's any more back country slash big woods, big country mountain whitetails than out here. Uh, There's some big stuff in the east side of the United States, but nothing with this elevation. Uh, We get there's places where my whitetails live into uh, that get 10, 12 feet of snow. Oh, the deer wow. have to, the whitetails have to migrate. So, and then we're loaded with uh, the alpha predators of the world: grizzlies, wolves, mountain lions, bear, black bear. You name it, we have it. So our whitetails are pretty incredible animals, and. Uh, the, the, the densities in the higher mountains isn't, isn't a real high density, but what we run into is we have a, a strain of whitetails that it's a lot like the Canadian whitetails, um, big bodies. Um, you've probably seen some of the deer I've killed, you know, very nice racked bucks for mountain bucks, mm-hmm. not, being, not being in the agriculture, uh, but still really good vegetation and habitat up here to where a, a buck can – a buck can hide out in this big country and get some age on him and get big. So, um, you know, I, 
I don't think it's the easiest place to hunt whitetails by any means, but <laughs> it's definitely exciting, challenging, and and invigorating. And and I've been hunting them with a bow and arrows since the '90s. I haven't, I haven't. That's the last time I picked up a rifle was in the mid '90s. So uh, for me, it's all about getting close, narrowing down a a great big single and out a buck in the middle of the mountains and narrowing him down and, and figuring him out. And, uh, you know, you kind of asked me, how do you even pinpoint something like that? Yeah. It, it's a lot of work and it's a system. You know, I have a system that's evolved that I've basically taught myself. Um, growing up, there was never any literature on mountain whitetail bow hunting ever. So I'm self-taught a hundred percent, never really had a mentor for bow hunting whitetails. My, my dad was a hell of a hunter, but he got killed when I was young he was a logger and he got killed. So I lost my dad in high school. And then I just kind of dove into this outside of te or outside of going to college. I played football in college in Montana. And, and uh, so I was always very competitive and liked a challenge. So I kind of, you know, I just took that side of me and put it into, I decided when I was young, I wanted to figure out how to bow hunt mountain whitetails successfully and pretty much had to be self-taught because there was no, literature or information on it so for me a lot of the stuff that uh i guess i would say that has happened for me and worked out for me over the years and it's just been pretty much self-taught learned and made a lot of mistakes along the way and then learned from them and just always very driven to to get this thing figured out to where i could be very consistent so for me now uh being consistent is it is is one of my major priorities and I like trying to find the oldest, biggest white tails in the country up here. So it's a lot of fun. It, it definitely looks like you have it figured out. <laughs> Again, I'm looking at his wall back here in, in amazement. Is that like your method? You talk about your method. Is that something you feel like you could write down and like somebody could read and like really, really learn from, or do you think like a lot of it has to be self-taught up there? Oh, I think, you know, I've had a lot of people over the years ask me to write a book and write book, write a book on it. And I do think I've pioneered a lot of the whitetail tactics and strategies for mountain bow hunting. Um, my age, of course, you know, I've been, I'm 52 or I'm 51. I'll be 52 next month. Uh, I've been at it a long time, four decades. And I started bow hunting in high school. So I started early when literally guys in this neck of the woods laughed at me when I was a kid and said, you're going to bow hunt whitetails. What? Good luck with that. Well, <laughs> that's all I needed back then. Even as a kid, I just needed to hear that. Good luck with that, you know, and laugh and older guys around town, you know? Uh, so for me, it was always uh, this internal passion I had just, I just fell in love with them when I was young on our ranch and just outside of St. Mary's, Idaho. And, my dad, before he passed, told me one time, my dad was an elk hunter and a mule deer hunter. And he said, you know, son, if you can figure out how to kill these big whitetails with a bow and arrow, he goes, you're doing something in this country. And if you can do it yearly, you're really doing something. So that stuff stuck with me as a young guy. And having the, you know, I always made time and had time to scout, shed hunt, walk hundreds of miles in the spring and summer when I had some free time. Uh, I love to shed hunt and just cover ground and it just all kind of evolved, you know, and I decided in my late teens, early twenties that I wanted to kill mature bucks only. And when I made that step and that jump and then really started figuring out how to get on these bucks in the mountain. And a lot of it had to do with, with biology of a whitetail. And, you know, I took an approach that was very much like a trapper would take an approach to trapping animals. I, I basically, in Idaho, you can't bait. Um, okay. It's strictly a no baiting state. So just to paint a picture for your listeners, I had to learn how to kill these mountain bucks in this huge country without bait, no bait at all, no feed. They're living on immense public grounds that have a lot of native great habitat feed. Just we're very, our country up here is gets a lot of rain. The timber grows like you wouldn't believe this is timber logging country and so does the vegetation. So there's plenty of water, plenty of native feed and 
more cover than you could ever imagine. Like literally more security cover than most people could imagine unless you come and hunt it. I mean, this is elk country. So with all that, all that to say, um, I was always fascinated, even high school with whitetails and biology. And I remember in my zoology class, I literally put together an entire whitetail buck skeleton, every bone, drilled every hole, put every bone together, uh, put a whole whitetail together and suspended it. And that was my project for zoology. So I was always a nut about whitetails. And then I dove into the biology of whitetails when I was younger and read everything I could find just on the science of whitetails back in the day, back in the se late 70s, early 80s, mid 80s and late 80s. Went off to college in the late 80s, early 90s and just kept reading the biology and hunting like crazy and getting them figured out. And that's where uh, I really dove into being a, using scrapes to hunt whitetails, to have a, you know, I was trying to find an advantage to get to see them in the daylight. So scrapes became a huge part of my game and, and uh, more so community type scrapes where all the deer in the woods use them year round. They use the licking branch year round to communicate. So anyway, I dove into that. And then it's just, it's just kind of uh, taken off from there for, from in my twenties into my thirties, I really started knocking down the oldest bucks around. And then I just tried to stay at that level since my thirties of, you know, five and a half year old bucks and older. So I have to ask those guys or there are people around your area that are laughing at you bow hunting these deer. Uh, did it take off after that, after they saw you killing them with a bow Were they all like in on it or. Well, I, I, I think what really happened was, is at first when I started killing them with bow and arrow in my twenties, you know, I think some guys that, that knew who I really was and know me personally knew what I was doing. They know how dedicated yeah. and serious I was, but the people that don't know me and all of a sudden this dude's knocking down big whitetails with a bow. I heard rumors. I heard stuff. I just, I never worried about it. I knew that I knew that over time my body of work would speak for itself. And I think some of the old boys that may have laughed at me and joked with me a little bit, uh, you know, they're still around. Yeah. They don't, they don't give me any shit anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so no, they're, you know, it's, it's all good. Uh, it's all good. And, and, and now I, you know, I do boot camps and teach a lot of people how to hunt these mountain whitetails out here. And I do an Idaho and Montana boot camp. And I think it's, I think it's got to where now, you know, I always felt like that if you're going to talk about something and if somebody wants your expertise on it, you need to have a body of work to back it up. So I just put my head down from 30 to my mid forties and said, I'm going to build a body of work and just keep my mouth shut and just let my hunting speak. And of course, for me, I was loving every minute of it because I'm happiest when I'm out in the mountains doing anything related to whitetails and you know growing up with a dad that was a logger we lived in the mountains for his work and I kept that tradition going even after I got my teaching job I I've always worked in the woods in the summers uh, whether it be construction dozer type work or logging or you know and I've done some farming too I've, I've just always been really interested in anything scientific based or biologically based work um so yeah, all that to say, uh, uh, you know, today it's just, for me, it's about the challenge of taking on a, an individual singled out whitetail that I've known for three or four years, maybe let him grow up, let him get to five or six and then go after him. That's what I love doing. Do you, uh, do you guys use like cell cams up there? I know we mentioned uh, we're on here now, but you mentioned not having any Wi-Fi. I know those run off of cell phone service, but do you guys use those? Do you have good enough service up there for that? Most of my spots, I can't get cell service, no. Uh, people people ask me, and I do have a couple spots where they work, and I'm loving it because it just cuts down my, my fuel expense, my travel. You know, I've talked to guys before on podcasts, and they'll they're, they're pretty surprised, but I'll run 20,000 miles a year on my truck. Wow. Um, uh, covering a lot of country over three states just to find a deer I want to hunt. Uh, so the cell cam answer is it's getting a little better because technology is picking up more. Excuse me. More towers are starting to get built. And uh, 
I'm starting to be able to use the cell cam every now and then. But now for for the last 25 out of 30 years, just in the last five years, it's got a little better. I'd say right now 10%, no, 5% of my cameras max areas I could run a cell, maybe 5% of my spots. That's pretty so low. <laughs> it's pretty low, but I'm also covering a big area. So 5% might equate to three cell cameras that are workable, three or four out of over a hundred trail cameras. So I'm not really to just to kind of put it in perspective for me and for the listeners, I'm not really used to tracks of land that are that big. So for me, like walking a mile, I mean, walking two miles is like a lot, like around here. If you walk two miles, you might get to the, the next road. So the reason why I asked about cell cameras and all that stuff is I was wondering how far in you went and how far you'd have to go to pull cards and stuff like that. Um, what's like a typical, I know typical is a vague term, but how far, how far deep are you going usually to hunt? Well, for your listeners, if you out here in the West, you know, obviously a lot of times I'm 25 miles off any highway. Wow. Just of pickup travel and then on foot two to five miles. Yeah. And, and some spots are closer. Some spots are over the bank or I can ride my e-bike in on a gated road. Uh, but a, a lot of my big woods mountain stuff is, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get away from what most people want to put in for effort. And yeah, it's more fuel. Yeah. It's more work. Yeah. It's longer days. You know, I'll, I'll drive four and a half hours to hunt for an hour and a half on the right buck and then drive four and a half hours home. Wow. You know? uh, wherever he's at, people ask me all the time, where's your honey hole? You got to have a honey hole. Now I, I literally hunt where I find the buck I want to hunt. And one year it might be a hundred miles or 200 miles away from where I hunted the year before. Do you ever let distance dictate um, any of that stuff? I mean, you just, I mean, I guess you probably do if it's across country maybe, but I mean, four hours, four and a half hours one way for an hour hunt is, that's crazy kind of, but it's well, interesting. And I'm not saying they're all like that, but some of them have been like that. It just depends on where those bucks are. If I'm, if I'm hunting a buck up by the Canadian border, it's three or four hour drive. And it depends what, on what state I'm in. What and, kind of, and then, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. There's a little bit of a lag. Oh, I just going to say that, you know, some of my stuff is close to home too. I mean, it's always nice to have a good buck close to home. And it's funny, close for me is within 50 miles of the house. <laughs> wow. What, what makes you choose a buck? Like specifically, do you have like any certain criteria or you're just like, you get trail cam pictures or whatever you, you see them scouting and you're like, I want that deer. I mean, is there like any kind of stipulations you have like in your head? Well, I, I go with age first. I, I won't even hunt a buck unless he's five. I don't care what he scores. Okay. I passed a, I let a one, I let a 170 non-typical, not even hunt him when he was four and a half because he was four and a half. And he was it, a public land deer and I didn't hunt him. And then I hunted him. Then I hunted him at five and a half. Is it the age because of um, them being more slick for the challenge of it? That's what you care about, right? The challenge. I, I really enjoy the challenge, but I, I like to see him reach his full potential. Mm -hmm. And just from a biological skeletal system based uh, determination, he doesn't even reach skeletal maturity till he's five and a half. So to me, a mature buck's five and a half or older. Okay. Because his skull plate's fully developed. His body's fully developed. So at five and a half and up, I feel like those bucks are not only physically developed, but their instincts and their survival skills by five and a half in this country, uh, just from the predators alone, are incredible. So yeah, the challenge, the challenge bar moves way up. Uh, you know, I like big deer, meaning body wise. Our bucks get heavy up here. They'll get to 250, 275 pounds when they get to five and a half. And That's a small a body. Yeah, and a small buck up here at, and I'm talking high country bucks. The lower mm -hmm. land country bucks are not always as big, but these high mountain bucks running up around five, 6,000 feet, 4,500, whatever, that live in the rugged, tough, cold conditions, 
that DNA in that country, all this higher country is, is a superior, bigger body deer. So I target specific DNA. I, I target age. And then of course, I mean, I love big whitetails. So yeah, I love it when they're carrying a big cage on their head to go with it. <laughs> but you know, I shot a big four by four last year that didn't quite score 150, but he was only a four by four, but he was six and a half. And his neck was 26 inches, the taxidermist told me. So, so, you know, to me, when he walked in and I saw that body and that neck and that just beastly old buck, that's my kind of deer. So it, it doesn't have to be about the score for me, but I like the age and I like how um, hard they are to kill when they get to that age. And usually what happens is they have a pretty good cage on their head too when they get that size. Do you run into very many people up there like other hunters? Oh yeah. You know, with this, anywhere there's big white tails, you're going to find hunters. Yeah. And in today's world with t trail cameras, everybody gets them on camera, even if they're two or three miles from you because these mountain bucks move. So I run into other hunters, but I really ever, I really haven't had much of a problem. You know, it pretty much boils down to the character of the person around you. Um, a lot of the guys, and I, I'll knock on wood, but a lot of the guys that I've run into, we all like our own space, and we really don't want to hunt right on top of each other. And we have literally millions of acres of public land between these states. We don't have to sit right next to each other in this country. Do guys sit within a mile of you, half a mile sometimes? Sure. You know, and I've always felt like, may the best man win. Whoever's doing his job the best, you know, good luck to you. Have you ever had any issues with, um, I know you have a lot of, you've been on a lot of podcasts and stuff on the internet and people probably know your truck and stuff. Have you ever had any issues like that where, where guys like want to move in because they know Troy's up in that area? Yeah, I think it happens. I think some guys are just trolls, period. Um, that's yeah. who they are as a person. So, yeah, I think I think there's been some people show up around me, you know, and I always hear the excuse, you know, I, usually where I'm hunting, not usually, always where I first start, uh, unless a buddy, you know, says, hey, Troy, let's go hunt this together. But when I'm out by myself on my own picking my spots, I walk a lot of ground to make sure I don't find any tree stand sites, setups or anything. And. I also try to go to a pretty high degree of getting away from the mass masses of people. I look for difficult uh, late season scenarios where I know there's going to be a lot of snow and hard to get through places. And I'm set up pretty good with equipment to get into those places and get out safely. So as the conditions get a lot worse during the season, I end up having even a lot more, uh, anonymity you know i'm off on my own a lot of times but there's a lot of hardcore guys in this country too it kind of just comes with living in the mountain country people are pretty hardcore so yeah i have people around it's never been terrible but i've had a few i've had a few dudes that i know they were hanging around in the area because they knew i was hunting the area sure yeah i think that's gonna come with it uh you know i figure if they're a better whitetail hunter than me and they can out hunt me then good more power to them yeah, that's, they'll, that's kill them, honestly, they'll kill them before you. Hey, if they get them, they get them, you know. And there's <laughs> there's been some really good bucks. I there's a guy that I that I found a buck and I knew and I found out later he was hunting him and he ended up killing the big buck. And I actually screwed up on the deer the year before and bumped my uh son's bow hanger at 18 yards on this deer. But long story short, and I won't say any names if he ever listens to this, a shout out to he's a good <laughs> he's a good he's a good dude and a hardcore hunter. I actually respect that. He ended up killing that deer the next year. And I was truly, genuinely happy for him because he's a good guy. And he busts his tail. He never moved in on top of me. I didn't go move up on top of him. You know, that type of thing. I do feel that with the real hardcore guys because none of these guys want to be right by each other. They're so deserving we all kind of, of it. Yeah, we all kind of keep our space. Now, hopefully the younger generations learn – you know, I'm speaking to every young guy out there. You'll do a lot better in life if you make you make those right choices and do what's right. Better things will come to you than if you 
get caught up in the hype and think and do things that are, I'd say, semi kind of unethical to try to kill a big buck because big bucks make people really foolish sometimes, really foolish. And you know, it's one thing I've taught my boys and about my my one son's a professional bass fisherman. My other son's my whitetail hunting buddy that's a college football player right now. I've always taught him that that don't, you know, don't ever succumb to the pressure. Do things the right way or walk away from it. Don't take that bad shot if you're not happy with it just because maybe dad would make that shot or or don't, you know. My son that's a heck of a bass fisherman, he's got he's got great character and ethics. He he won't go crowd a guy in his honey hole and run him off of it. Like he has guys do to him, mm-hmm. you know, and he's 20 years old and, and running with the big dogs now in the bass tournament or the bass circuit out here in the Northwest. But he takes that same mentality. I feel like I have for white tails or my younger boy has for football. My older boy takes that into his bass fishing. It's, it's really the same game. Good people are good people. People that wanted to have the easy way out and be lazy about it and follow you around, guess what? They're going to do that in life, period. It's kind of it's kind of the whole process, too. Like, I don't know, like if you, you're missing a puzzle piece, if you're just, you know, using somebody else's skills to move in on a deer, I don't know. I, that wouldn't be for me either. That's kind of the whole experience for me. Do well, you I ever? You learn, I don't know how you learn anything if that's what you're doing. Right. Do you ever feel pressure to – you kind of touched on it, but do you ever feel pressure to, to get a buck? Like just for, I don't know, not just yourself, but maybe for if you're filming or anything like that. Um, not anymore. No, I hunt for my own reasons. Like it's very spiritual to me and very, um, almost primal. Uh, Mm -hmm. I, uh, have spent so many solo days by myself in the mountains and out in the middle of nowhere when nobody's around and I got to get myself in and out of those mountains when I know a lot of people wouldn't even bother trying to get in. So for me, it's more about making sure I get home for my kids and my wife and really enjoying the, I really enjoy the, the chess match with these big deer. And I say this on almost every podcast and it needs to be said, they kick my ass a lot more than I beat them. And I love that. They, they teach me something every time I go to the woods. Uh, I, I think it keeps me young. It keeps me excited. Uh, I, I don't know that I would feel as challenged if I didn't live out where I live and hunt the animals that I hunt where I hunt them. I don't know. I have been, I've been to some cool states and hunted whitetails and, and killed some big whitetails out of state. And, I love that experience. I love that. It's almost like a vacation to me from the mountains. But I I can't leave these mountains just because what the mountains have taught me and what, you know, the lessons I've learned from them. And and I'm talking about not only just the whitetails, but the predators that are in it. I mean, I get a, I just killed a nice bull a couple of weeks ago. I love elk hunting. I love to bear hunt. Uh, I, I I just like everything that the mountains offer for me, everything from cutting firewood to, to uh, camping in the mountains to the huckleberries. I just love everything about the mountains. I kind of want to, I kind of want to dive into to locating some deer up there. Cause I, I have no idea what any of that's like. I'm, I'm from Indiana. It's super flat here. I go to Kentucky. There's a little bit of Hills. And to me, it's like a mountain. Like I'm just not, I have no, perspective on it how do you locate like bedding areas and stuff where you're at i mean is there tall grass and different stuff i i don't know why i'm just picturing it all as a bunch of trees and that and that, here's the picture i'll paint for you it's all timber country hundreds of miles of timber unbroken with some logging cuts lots of forest service and logging roads into the mountains uh, the underbrush is thick Northern Idaho is known for being one of the toughest places to hunt elk in the planet. You can ask anybody. You'll walk into the timber and you'll have a wall of brush 10 feet high for miles in some places, not all places, but a lot of places. Those make incredible bedding areas in there. They're great food sources. Then you add in steep blowdowns, everything mixed in with it. 
Then you add in all the predators. Um, so what you, you know, the way, the way I break down and find my whitetails is, is, is kind of twofold. You've got to have the right habitat, meaning you've got to have habitat that feeds them well and protects them well with security cover. And then you've also got to have elevation that works well with thermals and prevailing winds daily. These whitetails in this country have to evade mountain lions, wolves, grizzly bears, black bears daily. So everything, I did an article on it about 10 years ago with the local newspaper here. Everything for a big whitetail in this country, you can find him if you know how to study the wind and elevation, habitat, and topography. So I take habitat, right water sources, right feed, right security cover, the right elevation, topography that gives him a wind advantage daily to survive predators. And those are the areas that I target. Those are the areas that I infiltrate, put boots on the ground, break it all down, find all the sign, you know, find the scrapes, the rubs, lay it all out, find where his bedding zone is, where the doe family groups are living. Then I put all the pieces of the puzzle together and then I hang to kill. I put, I hang stands only if I know that I can get that deer based on intel in the daylight at that spot and that I can get in and out without ruining it. And I move around too. And I have to move a lot of times because my bucks move. So I'm, I would say I'm a half, I'm a, I have stationary great spots on big scrapes that are incredible year after year community scrapes, but I also have to be mobile and be able to move on a buck when he decides to move his bedding zone. Do you ever pick an area because um, the predators are less dense? No, because they're everywhere. Okay. Uh, one, the only thing that'll make me move and leave a spot for a while is if I have a pack of wolves move into an area, especially when I have snow and can see the tracks, usually when a pack of wolves into, moves into my drainages, if they don't leave for three or four days, they're there killing everything they can. Hmm. And then – for me, I always have to have a plan A, B, C, D, and E. Because if I don't, if I put all my eggs in one basket on a mountain buck, good luck. You ever have I your... to, Yeah, I try to have five bucks every year that I can kill, that are killable. Do you ever have the, the like if some wolves move in, do they ever kill your deer? Have you oh, ever yeah. Had that happen? Yeah. Um, I hunted a probably one of the best bucks I've ever hunted in my life about four years ago. I had him on trail camera for four years. I didn't start hunting him until the third year on camera. And at that time he was pushing mid eighties, one ninety. Um big public land, seven by eight, beautiful double splits. Anyway, I hunted him for a year, didn't get him, came close, actually missed him by 18 minutes at one tree stand one day. Trying to, and the only thing that kept me from killing him is the snow was so deep for me to get in there. It took me forever to drive up in. I had to chain up. This was late November. I was walking a mile and a half, and the snow was so deep, it took me an extra hour to walk to the stand. Wow. And I literally missed him on video by 18 minutes that day at my scrape. So then I hunted him the next year, and I was in the game with him, and I thought for sure I was going to kill him. And I was in the game like, I had built a, a community mock scrape that I had a two one sixties and him on. I put it in the right spot in late or in late October. And I was hunting him all of November. And I've told this story before on a podcast, my wife ended up needing an emergency surgery. And I told her, I said, I'm going to go up this weekend and whichever buck shows first, I'm going to kill. And I had the one, the beautiful six by seven, one sixty in there. I called six pack. And then I had the big boy splitter. And then I had another one sixty that wasn't around much, but he was around and six pack came in first. So I killed him that winter, that winter, my big split buck that was in the nineties, I was told he scored 90. The, the guys that found him, uh, he was killed by wolves. Huh? And they knew he had been, it was some cowboys found him, uh, checking range cattle. But the story was back to me that he scored 192 gross. Uh, they put a tape on him. That, that I mean, this is the story that came back to me. They definitely found him. He totally disappeared, and they found him. And they, you know, obviously pretty good find. 
Uh, but all that to say, that deer was probably in trouble if I wasn't in that situation because I had two weeks left to hunt him there. But I promised my wife the first one that came in, I'd be done so that we could take care of her business. Did you uh, did you get to see the sheds or the, like the skull and stuff? No, uh, I saw. I, I talked to a very credible source that got to see him and hold him. Yeah, and. He said, yeah, it was incredible. Um, and they knew that the wolves had killed that buck because all of his ribs were broke. When wolves eat something, they break the bones. When a cat eats something, it'll chew the nose off of it, but it won't usually break all the bones like wolves do. How's that make you feel when you're hunting deer like that and something happens? Does that make I knew feel... that deer, I knew that deer for five years. Yeah. Um, how did it make me feel? Uh, I got to be better. You know, I didn't get it done. Honestly, that's how I think, yeah. you know, I had, I got to hunt that deer for two seasons and didn't get it done. Uh, he taught me a lot. He really made me move on him and I moved. I just kept, kept after him and moving and getting closer. And then I started getting him in the daylight. So that's where I set up and killed the, ended up killing the other one, but make me feel, it's just motivating to me to like, next time I come across a white tail, that caliber that I got to be better you know, can't cut any corners and not, not slack in any way. You know, I got to make it happen when I have an opportunity, never stay home because you're tired or never back out because you make an excuse. I mean, I just, that's, that's one good thing that I've always tried to do is, Oh, I get on myself if I slack at all, because it'll cost you a good animal. You ever feel like you start slacking after a couple of weeks in no sleep, bad weather. You feel like, man, you feel yourself going down that that slope ever, and you're just how do you talk you know, your, I, how do you talk yourself out of that? I, I think I think what I think I, I'm cut from a little different cloth than some people. I grew up; my dad was a logger, and when I was 13 years old, he threw me into the logging industry full time in the summers. Mm. Thir 13, sawing fallen trees and bucking trees full time with my dad. Had to do man work all summer, 12 hours a day. So that was the hardest thing I ever did in my life when I was young. And then at 14 and 15, I got good at it. And it was just, but it was super hard work, hardest work I've ever done in my life. So things like high school and college football were easy to me. So my whole point is on this is my, my mental state when I'm grinding and when it's really hard, even to this day at my age, when it's tough and I'm wore out, all I do is think back when my dad had me logging with him and how much harder that was. So I, I guess what I'm trying to say is I can dig pretty deep for a whitetail, you know, <laughs> I can dig pretty deep and I I've spent a, I, I do, I spend a lot of nights in the backwoods in the back of my pickup in my back seat, in my quad cab or my crew cab. I sleep in my truck. I'll camp out on a buck for three or four days and never leave the mountains and you know, I've had nights where it's below zero in my truck and I don't want to start my truck because I don't want to make any noise. So I run a little tiny heater in there. But man, that's that's some fun stuff. You know, foot of snow, foot and a half of snow. I know I have to chain up to get out, but I'm in there hunting a deer, just me and the deer. And the and the world really doesn't exist out there other than what you're doing right there in the mountains. Or you forget about the you forget about the the noisy world down below. It's the whole experience. It's not just a, uh, not see, I, I leave my house. I go hunting for a few hours. I come back and it's warm or, you know, everything like that. I, I'm, I'm jealous of that whole experience. Oh, and uh, I love coming home to my warm house too. Don't get me wrong, <laughs> but it's pretty cool to spend three or four days at a time up in those big woods and just camp out. Killed a lot of bucks camping out on them that way, putting the time in. I feel like that probably helps your mindset too, you know, because you're completely immersed in it. You never like, you don't come home and I don't know, check the mail or read the bill. You know, you're completely, your mind is on killing that deer. And you're exactly right. There's no distractions. Mm -hmm. I, I literally just shift gears and separate when I get to the mountains. It's like, I always get an adrenaline rush as soon as I hit that dirt. And I know yeah. I'm headed up in, you know, it's an adrenaline. And a lot of times it's two, three in the morning. I head out so that I can be in a stand right at gray light. Uh, and then I love setting those all day sits once they're moving. And, and don't get me wrong. I love the early season right now, 
a lot of morning uh, evening hunts, which is a lot just more comfortable and easy, closer to home. But when it comes right down to it, the thing I cherish most about mountain whitetails is just the obstacles you overcome. But you learn to you learn to like love those obstacles because it kind of becomes who you are. Yeah. Let's uh, can we jump into scrapes a little bit? I know you're you're killing these deer a lot over scrapes, right? I know some guys are like push, push away scrapes aside. I, I've shot a few deer over scrapes, but I can't ever say that I could do it consistently. You're doing it consistently. Right. So we kind of talk about like, um, how you find success in those and kind of like placement, how to know where to put them, how big to make them, how to know what to put in them. I mean, I'm, I'm sure it even gets down to like, not touching certain stuff with your hands? Are you wearing gloves? Uh, could you just like fill me in on the whole thing? Yeah. Let me, let me back up to when I was young, when I was a kid in my teens, I used to hike like crazy in the mountains behind my house, South of St. Mary's, Idaho to find antlers. And I would use those antlers to buy school clothes. Hmm. But what that, but what that taught me was, um, well, to buy the fancy school clothes. My dad and mom were great, but they said if I wanted the fancy stuff, you know, I had to earn some money. My dad made me work for everything, which I'm very appreciative for now. But anyway, all that to say, what I started noticing, even as a teenager, and that's back when I was really reading reading every piece of biology I could find on whitetails. So this was early 80s, mid 80s. Um, I was hiking these mountains, picking up elk sheds, picking up deer sheds, and I noticed when I started getting up into the elk country, when I'm walking along, that's where I'd find my bigger bucks, higher elevation. So that started making some sense to me, picking up bigger sheds higher. And then I also started noticing big scrapes, even in the spring. Now, for your listeners, our whitetails, we'll get 10 feet of snow in some of the places I hunt, so they have to migrate. And they always, have, they always move back in the spring when the snow goes away. So these whitetails in this country, in the mountains, They've got to have some type of social communication center. And if you read up on the biology of how scrapes, a community scrape especially, really works, is the licking branches are used year round. As soon as the whitetails get into an area they like to settle in, and even in areas where, my, where whitetails don't have to migrate, they still use a licking branch year round. So what I started noticing in the spring, we're talking – March, April, May, picking up shed antlers, is I'd come across these great big scrapes every now and then. And I'd notice that even though it was springtime, there was deer tracks all over in the mud and the dirt in the scrape. They weren't pawing them. They weren't tearing the ground up. But it made sense to me, well, they're not, they're not pawing the dirt or tearing it up, but they're walking in the scrape. Well, why were there so many tracks all over in the scrapes? And it's because they're working that licking branch above. And they're sent communicating with all the other deer, basically saying, hey, I'm still alive. I made the winter. I'm back. I'm here. Well, that evolves into the summertime. And as the whitetails start growing antler and they start bacheloring up or the old hermit bucks roll into an area, they leave their scent communication via their forehead gland. They put that on that licking branch all the time, weekly in their areas. The does work the heck out of those licking branches year round. Those doe family groups do. So anyway, I started paying attention to that. In my mid teens to late teens, I wanted to bow hunt and kill whitetails in Idaho, which nobody was doing. Nobody out West was doing it in the mountains. I even, you know, I made a joke. <laughs> I talked about it to some older guys in town and I, you know, I, I, I joke about it, but they laughed at me. You know, we talked about this. And that really fired me up. I said, I'm going to figure this out scientifically, the science behind these deer. And I got to find something in Idaho that I can use because in Idaho, you can't bait. So the whole scrape thing took off for me young and early. And what I started doing was, is during the hunting seasons, even in my late teens and early 20s, once the whitetails really started urinating and, and using the scrape dirt and I knew they would hit the licking branch. Even on my ranch, we had a little 50-acre ranch. I'd watch them hit the licking branches all summer in the velvet on our place, on our 50 acres. So I started really paying attention, keying into this stuff back in high school. Well, going, you know, I started thinking, well, 
if they like these scrapes so much and want to communicate here, I need to start hunting over these. So that's what I started doing. I started setting up tree stands to bow hunt near scrapes. Now, back then, I didn't really understand how to differentiate and stay away from scrapes that were a waste of time and or were nighttime scrapes versus a true community hub scrape where all the deer in the drainage would know it. I learned that. I kept, I started picking up on that more and more as I was shed hunting into my late teens, early twenties and seeing these giant scrapes that always had tracks in them. Well, what I started doing was, is during the season, I'd take a Ziploc with me and a little tiny, my mom had this little tiny garden shovel, little tiny shovel. And I put it in my pack and I go to these huge scrapes that I knew of and I would dig the fresh urine and dirt up, put it in a mm-hmm. Ziploc, take it home, freeze it, take it to a different scrape, 5, 10, 15 miles away in a different spot, sprinkle it all over that scrape. And guess what that, guess what would happen at that scrape with the deer <laughs> activity? I just, inter- right up. I just introduced several new deer to that scrape. So what start, wow. what I started, so what I started seeing was big time daylight activity for me was zero bait. Didn't have to have bait. Wasn't breaking any Idaho laws. And I was just blown. And I was researching and uh, mind you, I was reading every book there was out there biologically about whitetail back in the day. And it was saying the same type of stuff, but I even noticed back then they weren't talking about the year round licking branch very much back then, but I was watching that happen. So anyway, then I started transplanting licking branches off of great scrapes to other scrapes. And then, and then every deer we would kill and my brother's my witness on this growing up, we would, I would take a, I would always have syringes, empty syringes for my deer kills and, or his, or if somebody else killed the deer, I would offer to gut it for him like my neighbors. And I would take a syringe and I would suck all the urine out of the bladder clean and I would freeze it. So then I started stockpiling urine and moving scrape dirt and moving licking branches. And I started seeing nice whitetails in the daylight and I started killing them. And then came along synthetics and buck fever synthetics. And I didn't have to go to as much work. And I start then long story short, I transitioned over to synthetic scents because it wouldn't rot. I didn't have to go to as much work. I didn't have to tear up deer scrapes, even though to this day, to this day, I will still move dirt sometimes on a scrape just because it's fun to watch what the deer do at a different area. Anyway, I, that's what ended up happening. And then I really started focusing in on only community type scrapes. And in a community scrape is a scrape that when you walk up on it and see it, you can tell based on the how beat up the licking branches are and how tattered and torn and vertical they hang and how usually the depth, not just the width and the size of the scrape, but how deep it's dug into the ground, you can tell that the deer have been using it for generations, decades. Those are the type of, those are the type of community scrapes or type of scrapes that I target only. I won't hunt any other type of scrape. It has to show decades of use or I will mock build one. I'll put multiple deer profiles in it and I basically trap whitetail big bucks close to their beds when I mock them up. I'll put it right in their face to elicit a daylight response. So that's kind of my game now. Natural community scrapes, or I mock them up, and I put them right at these big whitetails in the mountains. Let me ask you this. How do you tell between a nighttime and a daytime scrape other than with a trail camera? Real easy. Put a camera on it. Yeah. Just a camera would be the only way to tell. Well, it, it's some of the, some of, there's some really good community scrapes that deer only use at night. So yeah, I stay away from those. What I usually end up doing is most of the time I'll nail it because I'm in the right kind of security cover. I'm off the beaten path. I'm set up where deer feel pretty safe. So a lot of, I, it's lo- a lot of its location, you know, how close you are to to the bedding Scott, and everything. Yeah. Yeah. It's a ton of scout. Don't get me wrong. This stuff doesn't just, this stuff doesn't just blow in on the wind. I mean, it's, it's a lot of scouting, but it's also years and years of doing it to where 
I can get, I always start with a map. I always start with a satellite and a topogra topographical map, split screen side by side. I always pick the, I always go to elevation that I really like. Then I start looking for the right topography. Then I switch to habitat and I break down all the habitat based on what I know grows at those elevations. And then I start looking at slope and then I start looking at entrance and exit of getting into these great looking topographical features that I like. And then I'll go in there and I'll usually find what I want to find based on my map study. I'll start finding this. I'll see the sign. I'll see the scrapes, the rubs. The, I'll usually find a big community scrape in there. If not, if it's a great, great area and I'm just not finding it, I'll build one, throw a camera on it and see how it works. And it, they usually take off right away because I'm close to great bedding. Um, a lot of times too, when I find the actual natural one, all I got to do is put a camera on it. Those scrapes have been working for generations. They work year round. So I'll instantly have deer on it day by day at those places. Rarely do I strike out anymore, but it's been a learning curve over the years. When you started using synthetics, did you see a difference? Like in comparison I, to, to like, here, you know, fresh? I, yeah, I was actually shocked. Really? I was shocked at how well the synthetics worked. I almost feel like they work better from a trapping standpoint. You know, the concept of trapping, get an animal, getting an animal to get to you based on scent. I felt like the synthetics were strong at first. I didn't, I didn't know any different. So I'd smell them like, whoa. Well, mm -hmm. as soon as I started putting it out out here and I do it everywhere, I use it everywhere now, no matter what state I'm in Midwest doesn't matter. Uh, what I've learned is, is the wind is the wind is everything. So when I place a scrape and location, I'm placing it based on what the wind will do for me and which where the wind will blow that scent because I'm, I'm basically trapping a whitetail to come to me. So I'm throwing scent at them, the does and the bucks and the fawns and everything or a specific buck. And what I found with the synthetics is it doesn't ever rot, never mm -hmm. goes bad. And it sends out a strong initial scent cone it gets deer there right away and i'm i'm hearing that from 95 percent of the guys that get my mix from me they love it they're just i had one guy text me said troy 24 hours i had 17 bucks on it oh my gosh i'm not joking and this was a guy that actually has another podcast and he texted me he said troy i can't believe this huh. it's simple whitetail biology location Paying attention to detail, keeping your damn human scent out of it is huge. You know, I treat it just like I'm a scientist out there when I'm building these things. I uh, I have two questions. One, are you wearing gloves if you're touching anything? And two, well, I guess not really a question, but I'm glad you touched on it. I, when I've used scrapes, have tried to use it, um, you know, it's location based, but I never really thought about the wind of it. I never, I just kind of thought about a deer walking by it. I never really thought about the cone, about the scent the cone of it blowing. Uh-huh. It's yeah. all about the wind. You're trapping every trapper. Yeah. You ever hang out with a trapper? Trust me. They know exactly which direction that wind's going to predominantly blow. And they know what the thermals are going to do every day to help their scent. Yeah. It's really interesting. I, I, yeah, I'm going to try that. I, I Like I said, I've always tried to put it, you know, in an area where I think a deer is going to travel through, but I never, never really thought about wind, like it, it catching that scent. So um, are you wearing gloves? Um, yes and no. If it's really hot and latex gloves are going to make my hands sweat like crazy, no. Mm -hmm. If it's cooler out, yes. But I, I use Vanishing Hunter. I've used it for over 20 some years, Buck Fever Synthetics Vanishing Hunter. When I don't, when it's real hot and I'm building them in the summer, I just spray down. Uh, okay. And I and I've tested this stuff for years, watching my trail cameras and video after I leave the scrape, and I keep track of how long it takes for a buck to show up or a doe, and to see if they show any signs of spooking. This doesn't happen if I spray down with my hands. If I spray my hands down with the vanishing hunter, or wear the latex gloves, or both. I just don't have any issues with it. I don't have deer walk in on video and I always put a video camera on every one. That way I have true Intel pictures. Pictures don't give you true Intel. 
you choose but, uh you choose video over pictures because you can tell a little easier that they're they're spooked or not. Well, you learn their behavior. You learn you learn about the demeanor of every deer. Mm -hmm. um, you learn. I always have a in my video view. I always hang a windicator. That way, okay. every time a deer comes in, I can tell exactly what wind that specific deer is using to want to get to that scrape. Hmm. Plus, I'm studying every little thing, every little aspect about the specific. I don't care if it's a doe, a big buck, a young buck. I want to know everything I can about him. I want to watch how he behaves with that scrape, at that scrape, around other deer. And I want to really pay attention with that windicator, how he chooses or she chooses to approach that stand or that site. That's something I've never thought about either is checking the wind on a, on a camera. I think that'd probably help a lot of people out. They try that. Big, I'm going to try big, that. Big time on video. You got to run videos, spend the money on bigger cards, get a good camera that takes good video. And you will, you will gather 10 times the Intel as you will on pictures. We're not, we're not selling cameras or anything, but I am curious on what kind of cameras you like. Well, I've, well, let's see. Started using them 20 some years ago. I've tried to, but I've, I've purposely tested, I believe cameras in the toughest region there is. I'm sub zero temperatures. Mm. Uh, I run them. I run them all winter on purpose to see if they can handle it. I leave them out all winter. Uh, put them up high. I'll get seven, eight feet of snow in some spots for three months, but I run them all winter. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, the best camera that I am using right now, the toughest, best pictures, best video overall for the best price by far is the Suspect Hoot. Suspect Game Cameras out of Oklahoma. They are awesome. Yeah. And then I and then I love the Lone Wolf Custom Gear video camera for video. It's awesome too. The Suspect and the Lone Wolf Custom Gear are my go-to combo. Do you ever have any problems with batteries being that cold? Yeah, the 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 little the little the one thing I like about the Hoot, the Suspect Hoot, it's mm -hmm. small. And it'll last me all winter on a set of good Duracells. Okay. Usually what happens to me on video though, if I have it on video is my card fills up. Yeah. Even if it's a 64. Still going to fill up, but I get a ton of like literally Right before we got on, I was going through 449 videos on one card. Oh, wow. Off of Suspect 2. How long are your video clips? Are you setting them at 30 seconds? Or are you setting them like a minute or two minutes? I'm going short initially until I get a shooter buck. And then once I get a target buck, then I go to 30 seconds. Okay. So I'll do 15 seconds initially to make, you know, just so I get more videos. But once yeah. I get a target, yeah, once I get a target buck, then I bump it up to 30 or 60 seconds because I really want to, I want to get a ton of intel on him. I usually go 30 on the, on the target bucks. I, uh, I know we're bouncing around a little bit, but I, I do want to ask you something else about scrapes. W would you rather hunt a natural scrape or a mock scrape? I, I have a feeling you're going to say a natural scrape. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. It's very even. I, if you... Well, let me say this to the listeners the right way so it makes sense. You get the right location of either one, and then you put a game plan together not to ruin that site. Your entrance and exit, the details in your entrance and exit where you hang your stand is key. Um, then it doesn't matter. Then it's just, you know, I, I've built a mock scrape before, or I've built a couple mock scrapes that are just incredible community scrapes now that I built decade ago. They're still, they're still producing, but I also hunt a couple natural community scrapes that I've hunted for 20 years. And they still, I mean, behind me here, I've got one, I've got one scrape spot that I've got. This is no joke. A 166, a 172 and a 184 off of in the last decade. Wow. Same spot, same scrape over a deck or no 15 years time. And then we've killed other bucks in there too, but three big dogs. It's just incredible to get to hunt that same scrape, you know, four, five, six, seven years apart on the giants, but 
killed three different bucks off that same ridge. It's 60, 70, 80. Do you ever see scrapes like uh, fall out? Like they yeah. slowly just kind of go away? I, I, I've, I've had a, I've seen a couple. Well, one thing that'll really wreck a scrape is all kinds of human intrusion. Somebody finds it, somebody gets it on camera and then they wreck it because they don't know how to hunt it uh, effectively. That'll ruin okay. a scrape and the deer will move to a different one. Uh, logging. And I love logging. Don't get me wrong. I love the habitat that it creates and it gets rid of forest fire danger and all that. But if, if a, if a logging company comes in and clear cuts where you have a great community scrape, you just lost all your yeah. security cover. It's done. Um, one of the best bucks I ever hunted in my life that happened to me two weeks before season, that buck was dead to rights. I was going to kill him opening day, opening day, August 30th. I was going to kill him on a licking branch. I mean, he was daylight every day. I was watching him with binoculars on the top of a mountain ridge, the very top of an old clear cut from a mile away. I mean, I had this deer dialed and I got a phone call from a buddy and he said, Hey, Troy, if you got any tree stands out there on such and such ridge, he goes, we're about ready to log the whole thing. Oh, you wow. might want to pull. And I said, well, when are you going to go in? He goes, August 15th. And the season opened the 30th. <laughs> I, I, ne I never saw that deer again after they clear cutted it. That's why you always got to have uh, B, C, D, right? Amen. Absolutely. Then, you, then you're not, then you're not mentally broken down much when you got options. You know, it doesn't beat you up too bad. So I know there's a lot of like a uh, question about peeing and scrapes. How do you feel about that? Well, I've done it and I've never had a bad reaction, but I don't make it like a habit. But yeah. I've done it. I'm very, a very curious guy. Very, you know, I want to know. Yeah. So I, I tested that for on video camera for probably, I probably, I'll bet I, I bet I tested that over a 10 year period. And I've always peed off my tree stands too and never had an issue ever. Would you advise never. guys to just try it out in their area just to kind of see I'd what the deer's reaction is? I'd advise guys to think for themselves and yeah, decide on their own. Hey, if you want to say to me, no way am I doing that? Good for you. Yeah. But I, I test things. I test everything. Okay. You know, I, I thought about it years and years ago when I heard all the hype, never to pee out of your tree stand. And I started thinking about the science of it. Urine is urine. Mm -hmm. And as long as you're not pissing through your hands and getting human hand scent, skin yeah. scent on it, you know, and if it's just straight urine. So it was funny because I was talking to a, a guy out of Michigan that was a hardcore old guy hunter. And he would always say, if you piss off your tree stand and a deer hears that pee and hit the ground, if a deer hears that, they'll think something's peeing in a scrape and they'll come and check it out. So I was like, you know, back when I was younger, I was in like my thirties, I started peeing off tree stands. And what's crazy is to this day, I have never once had a negative reaction from a deer hmm. to this day. Or an elk. I'll have elk walk right by if I, they don't even pay attention. I, and, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's out here. It doesn't bother me that much, but I've never watched a deer freak out or an elk from it. Yeah. I'm kind of wondering too. Uh, I, I used to be that way. Like I'm not going to pee out a stand. Then I started thinking about noise, but I wonder if it's uh, like location specific. That's why I said you should probably just like, don't, you can't just like listen to what somebody tells you. You got to kind of try it out for your area. Cause I imagine some deer in some areas are more spooky than others too. You know, and I think my deer would be as spooky as anywhere. My deer get hunted by lions and wolves daily. <laughs> That's a good reason to be very spooky. Yeah. I mean, they're not getting hunted that hard by humans, even though humans think we're hunting them hard. I'll yeah. tell you what, a, mount, a mountain lion can out hunt anything, anything. And they don't have hardly any sense. A lion doesn't. That's interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, those cats are clean. That's why cats are so clean. Even a house cat mm. is super clean for a reason. They keep themselves clean. It's because they're killers. So we talked about mock scrapes. How how do you decide how big to make them? Like, how do you know if you need to make it a, a foot wide or if it needs to look like the like a truck hood? Is that like uh, the size of it matter? I I think so. I I. I base my mock scrapes on the intel that I gather from my scouting in those drainages. So okay. let's say 
let's say I'm in Montana in one spot. I, I pay extreme close attention to the tree species that the deer prefer. I pay close attention to what the dirt at the big community scrapes looks like in that country versus say Washington. And then I play that game. I give the local deer in every different drainage in different States, what they like and what they're used to seeing. Okay. Um, but I do also believe in a visual, you, you want to have a visual um, stimulus and you want to have that scent stimulus to be a good trapper. So the visual stimulus I give those whitetails is incredible looking torn and tattered licking branches that they will literally see 40 or 50 yards away. So I take a lot of time sculpting them out, making them look right. And I get them to hang vertical and I get them to really look like they've been beat up for decades. And then I want a buck when he looks over and sees that even before he might smell it. If he sees those licking branches, I want him to lock on. And then I'll always scatter on purpose two or three or four mock rubs around it because those mock rubs will stick out at 70 or 80 yards to a buck. So I've got the visual and I may already have a scent, but I may not. So then when it gets to the dirt part, that's the dirt part is visual too. Then I want him to see that soil beat up, broke up and pretty good sized. I'm, I never usually build one under three feet. It's at least three feet, the kind of teardrop shape at least three feet. So they see that visual. I want them to see that everything's boom, 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 stimulus, 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 attractant, right? Then you hit them with the scent, the forehead on the licking branch. I put multiple deer urines, different deer profiles in the dirt. I want that. I want any deer that walks by that to immediately process that there's more than one deer using that. That's what a community scrape, that's why a community scrape is so much better than an individual rut craze scrape or a frenzy scrape. And then I make sure it's in great security cover, great travel corridors that are safe to the deer. Then I also make sure I can get in and out of it, infiltrate it without ruining the area. So I put all those pieces of the puzzle together, give them all the visuals, all the scent that they need. Everything makes sense to them. They think multiple deer are using this. And a lot of times when I build a mock, I'm putting it in an old hermit bucks area that he lives in, his bedding zone, even close to it. They're shocked that they missed it when they first walk in on video. They like yeah. act like, how in the hell did I miss this scrape? Because <laughs> they've been living there for five or six years. Right. You follow me? And that's how they react on video on camera. If you go to my YouTube and actually pay attention to what I've talked about tonight about how I build those mocks and watch my oldest, biggest bucks walk in, and I list on there first time in, first time in, first time he found it. You watch his body language. They'll circle it. They'll scent check the heck out of it. They'll cover it, and then they start showing up in the daylight more often. It's cool to watch them find it the first time. How often do you have to freshen those scrapes up? When I build a mock or I overmark an existing awesome community scrape that's already there, I load it up heavy with scent because I'm, again, I'm trapping. I want the scent to go a mile. And mm -hmm. I use the wind. I use the wind and the thermals to carry that where I want it. So I'm positioning this stuff where I know it's going to go to bedding. Okay. To answer your question, I load them up really heavy initially. The deer take them over right away within it. A lot of times within six, seven hours, I'll get a deer there. And I'll usually get a big – if there's a big buck in the area, I usually always get him within two days, which is, isn't bad when you're trying – and that's usually usually daylight. So then once the deer start hitting it, they do all the work for me. They start overmarking me. So then it becomes so a competition. And then you don't I worry only, about the – I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, go you ahead. Don't worry about the, you don't worry about the urine soaking in the ground, or do you use something else, like some kind of um, like container to hang up? Oh, no, I want the urine in the ground. Yeah. That buck, buck fever synthetics and urine crystallizes. When, it, when, it, when urine breaks down, it crystallizes. Buck fever synthetics does too. When it gets rained on, it re-emanates its scent. Urine, oh, okay. works that way in the, urine works that way in the world of animals. That way, animals like bears, coyotes, mountain lions, whatever, 
can come by. You know how coyotes will piss right over the top of any other coyote piss, just like your dog will. Mm -hmm. Urine, urine breaks down and works that way naturally. So you want it in the dirt. It'll crystallize in there. That scent will hold for those animals. They smell that for, for months. Even when a human can't smell it, they can pick up that residual scent. So anyway, on the buck fever synthetics, I want it in the dirt. I really, I tr tried drippers and played around with that stuff. That just became a pain in the butt. My, yeah. the dirt worked, the dirt worked better for me. Um, okay. Why does it work so well? Because it's, because that product that I use, and I actually have my own mix. I do a combination to make a, several profiles. Um, but anyway, all that to say, and I, I, I ship that stuff all over the country to guys, my own mix. Just to, if anybody's interested, it works. But anyway, that urine needs to be in the dirt, but the key is that licking branch. Putting that forehead scent gland on that licking branch is a whitetail's ID card. Okay. And when those deer take that over, to answer your question, the only time I refresh in is if I'm going to hunt the stand or check the card. That's it. I don't go when in you, extra because I don't want human scent in there. When you initially make the scrape, I know you mentioned when you were a kid, you were using that shovel to kind of like a little hand shovel to steal some of the dirt. How are you making, how are you scraping everything out? Like when you're way back two miles are you carrying a little shovel with you or are you using your boots nope, or a i stick? don't i don't want to carry any tools no i just use a big stick yeah i'll break i'll break a great big limb off a tree like a doug fir tree that's stout a very rigid mm -hmm. limb i'll bust one off and i think i actually i really need to load some more content on my youtube but i think i have one video in there where i'm building one and i just i use what the woods offer me and it works great i'll grab a great big stick you know, three or four inches in diameter. Uh, I don't know, four feet long, stay back a little bit and I'll scrape all that dirt out with it. Uh, touch, put all my urine on the ground, forehead gland all over on the licking branch, pack that stick out of the woods, a hundred or 200 yards and chuck it over the bank. That's what, that's what I've always used to make scrapes too. That's how I was taught when I was a kid is to just use a stick. So I was kind of wondering Yep. We always carried ours off, you know, a hundred yards or so. Um, I was kind of wondering what your thoughts were on that, but you answered that for me. Yeah. You and my hand get that scent super far away. Yeah. And the truth is I'm, I'm clean as can be. I'm always, my hands are always sprayed down. I've never had any issues with that either. Never how, had any how, issue. Go ahead. I'm sorry. How close are you hunting to the scrapes? Are you like 20 yards away? Or are you picking I, I always tree? take sure i i always make sure i can kill it that's great yes yeah okay and i like i like slam dunk shots so i'm usually 20 yards away yeah see i've heard a lot of guys up. not wanting to hunt right on top of scrapes they want to hunt a little bit away from them so that's interesting well a lot of guys do i i don't want to i don't want to be hunting away from a scrape and there's a my best whitetail standing in the middle of it for a reason yeah um a lot of guys like to hook, you know, try to set up on that, the the predominant downwind side of that scrape based on whatever their wind currents are. Uh, that's fine, but if you're set up on the downwind side of it, you better be set up on the other side of that downwind side because if you don't have that dialed right, you just ruined that whole setup. You got to be on the other side of where you think he's going to come downwind of that. No, and it's funny you bring that up because let's talk. You know, Andre DeQuisto and I talk a lot, and we were talking about that. And Andre said, "Yeah, he goes, I learned the hard way. He goes, as soon as you try to set up like that too far downwind, you end up having a big one in the scrape." And I agree with him. I don't ever want to miss one of my big bucks that likes my scrapes, that shows me he does on the camera. I want to make sure I can kill him there when he comes in there. So that kind of brings up another question for me. Are you ever setting up um, stand locations? Are you always putting up and tearing down like every after every sit? Because I'm kind of wondering about if you have, if you do leave a stand there and, and sticks attached to the tree and you're only 20 yards from the scrape, are those deer going to spook because you've been climbing up and down those sticks? Are they going to like, you know, smell the sticks, smell your scent on, you know, the metal or whatever? Um, no, I don't, I've never, I've never wanted to, especially with mountain deer, they're, they're way too, 
they're crackheads. They're way too skittish. Mm-hmm. If if I'm hunting on a scrape that just produces and is producing and has for decades, my stands stay and they only get uh, readjusted and new straps over the decades if they need when they need them. So I want I'm a minimal intrusion guy. Okay. I don't want a bunch of noise. If uh, in my in my woods in my country, if I uh, go in and hang and tear down and hang and tear down at the same site, I won't see many deer. They'll they'll hear me. They'll be on to me. They will avoid me. So at my really at my great scrapes, the stuff's preset and it's hung on top of them, and it's it's in super quiet. I'm very clean. Uh, in and out, hardly any intrusion. I've got the wind dialed for them and me both. I usually have some type of terrain barrier that protects me in my setup. And then I can hunt those. And I call it a bulletproof setup. I can hunt my stands over and over and I don't see a difference in my deer frequency. You know, and there's, there's times where when you're hunting a mountain buck, if you got him three days, a, in, if you have him three days a week in the daylight, that's good. We're talking mountain deer that travel and cover a lot of ground. Even even in the early season and late season, they shift which way they feed directionally just based on the predominant wind every day. They always have a wind advantage. How far so do they that, travel usually? Oh, it's nothing for a for a, a mountain a mountain whitetail in the early archery season of September to go two miles just to go to feed or three. Hmm. And in the rut, you better count on your big bucks traveling 10 miles a day, a lot of them. Wow. And, and you need to know where those hubs are and where those doe family groups are to intercept them in specific points. Oh, it's, it's, a, it's a big country out here. It's different. It's way different. Yeah, I can't, I, I can't imagine how – I mean, I'm, like I said, I'm so used to little five, ten-acre pieces, and I, I hunt an area in Kentucky that's – 8,000. And I feel like that's huge, 8,000 acres, but I mean, that's probably nothing to you guys. When you are going mobile, yeah, what I do, what are, yep. what are you using? Um, cause I know you're walking, you're walking far, so you gotta be packing light. Yeah. And I do have to go mobile at times to move on a buck, especially towards his bedding. And I will do it when I need to, I'll have to, sometimes I'll get off one of my real nice, my really good scrape sites because I know that I'm not close enough to him to get him daylight and I'll move right at his bedding area. When I go mobile, I got a lone wolf custom gear Mm 1.0 and I run four and I run four long sticks. And that's the lowest, uh, that's the lowest I hunt out here. I'm in steep terrain. I'm wanting to get involved in, in some of that gear myself. Do they, uh, do they have like the cam buckles on the, on the sticks or are you using like the, the rope guys use to kind of cinch down. Do you kind of get into all that for weight and stuff? Well, yeah. And and that weight stuff just to me doesn't even, I mean, there, I grew up packing 40 pound stands. Yeah. So, so to me, this whole weight debate and, and I get it, the younger generation, you guys, I get it. You're into that stuff. Heck I grabbed that (laughs) 1.0 and I grabbed four long sticks and I think I'm in heaven because I'm used to packing in shit that used to weigh 40 pounds. Yeah. And now I'm packing eight or 10. So I just giggle at the, I, I honestly, for me, cause it's cause I'm old school and I don't care if it's 10 pounds or 12, that doesn't matter to me. Yeah. Um, and I run the long sticks cause I, I have to deal with thermals and steep mountain country. You got to play the wind a little bit different than flat ground out here. So I hunt a little higher than a lot of guys. Something I've always wondered. Cause like I use a, I use a summit climber, you know, and set stands, but I, ha- I, I haven't gotten to the whole stand and sticks yet, but I, I plan on it next year. When you take like, I don't know, four sticks in and you only need three, what do you do with the other one? Cause I imagine you don't want to leave it sitting on the ground. Um, uh, you can, you can bury anything and they won't smell it. Yeah. All you got to do, if you, if in the woods, there's a reason why there's a reason why uh, mountain lions shit and cover it up. You can bury anything under a little bit of dirt and debris and nothing will smell it. 
Just try it sometime. Take a freaking dump in the woods and cover it with six inches of dirt. You'll never smell it. There's a reason why lions are so stealthy. Seriously. That's no joke. So if I had to stash something, yeah, I would cover it with, uh, I'd grab pine needles and leaves and throw some dirt over it and just cover it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I usually, what I take, I hang. Um, as far as the climbers, I can't use a climber out here. I can't. I, my The bark on conifer trees is so noisy that you literally will wreck your spot if you try climbing with a climber. Mm. Now, for bow hunters, because I'm always tight to bedding. Yeah. If I'm, if I'm a rifle hunter out here and want to climb a tree with a climber and set 300 yards away from where I, the deer are hanging, no problem. But I'm talking about bow application up close. Plus, I'm right next to tight security cover always where I hunt. So I always have deer pretty close. Could you, um, for the listeners, could you paint the picture of a perfect stand location? Is that even like possible, I guess? I know everyone's going to be so different. I've got, I've yeah, like a bulletproof where you can hunt it over and over. Yes, sir. Yeah, I've got it. I've got one. I've got, I've got one that's been unbelievable for 20 years. So can you describe it a little bit? Yeah, I will. I'll, I'll tell you exactly how it works. And it's still to this day, one of the best stand locations I've ever seen. So I've got a, I've got a ridge, a big ridge at the top of a mountain that runs, let me get this right, west to east. You follow me? Yes, sir. So the ridge runs west to east. We get a lot of south and west winds. Um, it's not perfect west to east, but it's close. Okay. okay? It's a little more, it's a little more southwest to northeast, if you will. Okay. okay. So in this country, we get a lot of west winds. So that ridge is just slightly canted. I can even show here on the video. It's slightly canted. Okay. okay, With the wind, with the wind that comes across it like this. So what I, the reason this stand is incredible. um, I set up on this ridge. I always come in from the east. I always come in from the east. I climb up a straight super steep face mountain for about 800 vertical feet. It's a bitch, (laughs) but I have to come in. I have to, I come in from the Southeast, climb up the mountain, get on the right elevation of the stand. And then I side hill over to the stand all from the East. You follow me? Yes, sir. So I climb up into the tree stand and I'm looking West and I, have the north to my right and the south to my left and i'm looking straight at that west and that i so what happens in front of me is i get a south wind across my face to the north and i get a west wind in my face and i get a northwest wind back across my face at another angle so i'm getting an x Mm -hmm. but it's always i always come from the east And my scent is always traveling at least at an angle off my shoulders or right at me, but, or off my shoulders out in front of me on that Ridge is the lowest saddle on that whole Ridge for a mile on one side of the saddle out in front of me, 20 yards, 25 yards is this saddle. Okay. Now I'm starting to build and paint the picture for you. The saddle is the lowest spot on the top of that ridge. And in mountain country, that's the only place you're going to get a true wind. The thermals out in front of me push uphill on both sides during the day and drop in the evening and are dropping early morning. I'm always coming in way backside, setting back to the east, and the prevailing over the top keeps pushing me back, even though the animals working through that saddle are using the thermal. Does that make sense? Yeah. They get, to use, they get to use those thermals to climb in the early morning, and they get to use the thermal up high when they're up in it in the midday to come up to them. But the prevailing wind for me, as long as I got a decent prevailing wind, my scent always blows out over my back trail at at least an angle. Okay? I never, ever cross that scrape 20 yards in front of me in the saddle. I never cross it. Hmm. I've, I've got travel both sides of the ridge up the north face and up the south face and down and from west to east towards me. 
So everybody's going to say, well, what about the animals that are traveling east to west? Okay. I'm sitting literally in a tree that has a bluff right behind it that drops down about a hundred straight feet. Hmm. And I have to come up around that bluff and circle around it from the east. But where my tree stand is, I literally have a rock bluff that drops hmm. off. So my scent actually drops over 120 feet off that stand. Let me let me ask you let me ask you this. Do you have cameras in there? Oh yeah. I've got I've got a picture camera and two videos in there. Yeah, I was gonna ask you how often you climb up that thing to check the cameras. I don't. I let them run and I go hunt it and I check it maybe once a month. And I've got an e-bike to get oh, I have an e-bike to go in on the north side. I can okay. ride my e-bike right in in the middle of the day when stuff's bedded and go in and out, silent, check the camera, and leave. Huh. So that saddle has an old, old logging skid trail that I've cleaned out that I can use my e-bike on to get in quiet and quick. I won't hunt in that way. I'll come in the backside. But yeah. in, the summer, in the summer, you bet, I'll check my camera on my e-bike. You hunt that spot every year? If there's a big enough deer there. Yeah. There's always a nice bull there. There's always a big bear there. There's everything there. It's one of those incredible terrain-based spots. Oh, and on the north side, 40-year-old clear-cut, thick as 75 acres of logging clear-cut that mm -hmm. all the animals bed in right below the saddle or come up through. It and a like thousand a feet, yeah, a thousand feet below me on both sides of that ridge, agriculture in the bottoms. Uh. Actually, 2,000 feet. Is there a sweet spot of elevation that you like to be at? Depends on how high the mountain is. Yeah. I usually hunt the top third, unless it's too high. My my favorite, if you ask me pure elevation, Troy, just pick one, 4,500 feet is my favorite. Okay. How do you deal with, uh, like, shifting winds? Like, if you're in a stand and you get shifty winds or something, and I don't know, it goes bad, are you staying there or are you leaving? If I think my wind is blowing right at my buck's bedding zone, I leave. Yeah, you don't think it's too late? Not if it did. Well, I pick, I mean, I'm paying attention. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm usually 100, 200 yards from me minimum, sometimes three or 400 in the mountains because they'll travel 300 yards to a mountain deer is nothing, nothing piece of cakewalk. Hmm. Uh, if I do get a, if I do, yeah, it's a lot, just everything's bigger out here. The travel distance, what deer will do, uh, how far they'll travel right before they want to get, even if they're trying to, there's old bucks that don't even want to move in the daylight. That's just how they are, especially early season. They, they just, why get up during the day if I don't have to? Yeah. Why? Just in the, they're just wired that way. Yeah, they're, I mean, they're, they figured it out. If I don't get up in the day, I don't get, I don't get killed. So, so <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, that's where that's where that whole idea, that concept of throwing a trap at a buck, throwing that scent at him, that elicits a different response than if you have nothing there, because that's biological for that deer. All of a sudden, he's got all this scent in his nose that's very authentic to him, and he's like, "What's going on here? Why do I smell five different deer down below me?" I'm going to go check it out. So I, I always have a scrape. I don't hunt a whitetail anymore without a scrape incorporated. Even when I go out of state, I'll build one in five minutes. Always. Huh. I always put one in and it's quick and easy just to throw some scent, right? And I always am placing it where the wind's blowing and I get off to the side. I always hunt an edge wind, always on the edge of their wind. They have good thermals. They have good wind. I'm off to the edge of it. So they're happy with what they got, and I'm just missing them. Do you ever go to other states where you've put out um, scrapes like prior years, and you go back and you look at an old one that it's all tore up still? Oh yeah, I yeah. um, I I won't even say what state it is, but it's a southern state, and it's got big white tails. And I killed a 186 inch deer down there, and I killed him in two hours, and I put a scrape out, and he came right to it. Wow. My buddy when. I when, my, when I killed him, my buddy couldn't believe it. I texted him. I said, he's dead. He goes, no effing way. I said, he's done. <laughs> he walked right to it. But I used that scrape to – he showed me right where he was bedding. And I yeah. had been studying all the trail camera videos and pictures my buddy had. He goes, come on down. You can kill him. Well, 
I didn't set up where they wanted me to. I set up off to the side, down closer to the bedding, threw a scrape out 15 yards in front of me, climbed up my stand in two hours. He was there, walked right to it. It was strictly that scent. He came right to it and I got closer to his bedding. I've never used synthetic. I've always used the real, the real stuff from the store, you know, but I don't ever know really how old it is or anything. So I'm, I think I would need to get some synthetic and try it. Yeah. Well, let me, let me give you a little science lesson. If you use the real stuff from a store, it's protein based, it's real and it's rotten. It stinks. Mm -hmm. yes. It'll spook you. Hmm. Don't use anything natural protein based. That's rotten. If you ever, the next time you kill a deer, dissect the urine out of the bladder and smell it. It has no rotten smell to it all. And as soon as natural urine hits the ground, the first stages of urine breakdown out in the air is meant to have an ammonia-like smell to get out through the air. It's strong, mm -hmm. but it won't smell rotten. The stuff that you buy at stores that's real, that's been bottled, will smell like an outhouse. It'll smell rotten. I know exactly and deer, what you're talking about. <laughs> and deer will spook from it because that's not natural. That's like, that's a rotten dead smell. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. How long can you keep natural urine? Like if you take it out of a deer, have you found like I, if it's frozen? I just freeze it. And you can just, as soon as you thaw it, you got to use it. Yeah. Don't want to leave it in your heated up truck for two days or anything like no, that. I, yeah. I wouldn't. I used to I used to use it all the time 25, 30 years ago because that's what I had. Now, now I don't. I just use synthetics. And the synthetic never rots. You you can you can put the synthetic that I use on the shelf for two years and use it two years later and it works great. Huh. Buck fever synthetics, man. It's good stuff. Well, I have one last question for you. Um we're getting we're right at an hour and a half. Um, if you're uh, hunting during the rut and it's bad wind, are you staying home or are you hunting? Well, I don't, I don't think there's such thing as bad wind. Okay. I think because, because I'm hunting multiple options, multiple places I can go hunt multiple deer. So for me, I always have an option for any wind direction. You know, when, when I hang a permanent set that's going to stay on a great scrape and a, a funnel uh, hub area, mm -hmm. I, make, I make sure that when I lay out all my best spots on the biggest bucks I want to kill, the oldest bucks I want to kill, I make sure that I have an option for every wind direction I'm going to get during the season. It doesn't matter. And if you're mobile, it doesn't matter at all. You just adjust and move a little bit. So you have that option too with your mobile setup. One thing I have done before is let's say I'll get a odd east wind on a big deer I'm wanting to kill and my stands set up for mostly west and southwest, which a lot of them are. I'll just take my mobile setup in that day and put it on the other side and hunt it. And I well, might leave it three or four and I might leave it there for three or four days if the weather says I'm gonna get three or four east winds. I'll just leave it and hunt out of it done that before what would you advise to a guy that's only got one stand set up i know that's not the ideal thing but you know it exists oh um, yeah in that situation what what's he do does he hunt i mean maybe he's a guy do. that doesn't get oh, out very often or something yeah if you're mobile go hunt because you can always say i mean that's how i hunt elk i'm yeah. mobile when i hunt my bulls i always move on them and i get i get a wind advantage but get that i usually get on a wind edge because i want them to like the wind they're going to come into also but I'll get off to the side. I do the same. I do the same thing with whiteies. And if I only had one stand set up and all I was using was my mobile setup, oh yeah, I would bounce around, and I would hunt my best spots with big deer on them, and I would set up perfectly for that day's wind and thermals, which okay. I end up doing sometimes when I need to get, you know, when I need to get in the game on a big buck or I need to uh, move on a deer. It's, it's it sounds like it's good to have options then definitely i mean if you just have one stand location i mean you're just oh, you're kind of screwing just, yourself right yeah i think a guy needs you need to be extremely uh what's the right term you need you need to be very flexible and have the ability to go with whatever the scenario and the equations 
gives you. You got to be able to handle that equation. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I've, I've killed some deer, but nothing super nice. And I kind of was in the mindset of a, a long time of if I sit here long enough, I'm going to see a deer. Now I'm kind of getting away from that and I want to do more mobile stuff. So it's interesting to hear about, you know, moving around and all that stuff. I, I've been doing that this year and I've really enjoyed not staring at the same field, you know, for days on end. That gets so yeah. old. Yeah. And get in the cover, get in, get in the security cover where they feel safe to move. And the truth is I'm hunting, I'm killing the majority of my big white tails close to where they're bedding. Almost always. Other than a two week to three week period during the rut where I'm hunting over really nice doe family group areas that I'm seeing daylight does all the time. And I know my bucks are going to be there to breed them. Uh, the rest of my season, the other eight or nine, let's see, what does it be? Shoot, it would be September, October. Uh, the other 12 to 14 weeks outside of the rut, which I'll consider what would be rut movement, which is pretty much a whole month with scraping. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm bedroom close. Hunt the yeah. beds, hang your heads. <laughs> I like that term. Um, could you tell everybody kind of where to get um, – synthetic urine at um what you're using and uh where to find your youtube channel and stuff some some people might not be watching on youtube so they might not see the little ticker scrolling at the bottom so i want to make sure people can connect with you if they have questions or um want to get some some of that stuff yeah um if guys want to chat with me I, i'll instagram's the best place to talk to me and my instagram is mtn underscore man so mountain man 33 M T N underscore man, uh, my IG 33 or Instagram mountain man 33. And then my YouTube, just my name, Troy Pottinger, uh, buck fever synthetics is the product I use. And, you know, buck fever is really good to me. So I actually have my own, uh, big supply of buck fever that I ship all over the country personally. And I may, I, I give guys my personal mix. If guys, want my stuff just find me on instagram if they want uh my stuff's pretty big quantities i don't do small eight ounce bottles or anything but you get my own personal mix you can just go to buckfever.com and order right off their website too so whatever guys want mine is basically a blend that i have concocted over the years that i really gear it towards multiple profiles and multiple deer on purpose because Community scrapes are where it's at. That's where all the deer want to be. They want to know who's there, you know, versus one deer versus scent checking one deer. They want to scent check. A buck wants to scent check eight or nine different does, not one. Or, you know, you know what I'm saying? So I play that community scape, scrape game, multiple profiles in my scrapes. How big of a bottle to, of your mix is it? Is it like a gallon? What's the price on that? Just for what what know. I do, I have my own, you know, and I got my own mix. I even I even have a couple things in there that I put in it that I just keep to myself that I've used for years. It's all synthetic, uh, okay. so nobody has to worry there. And it's the the foundation of it's all buck fever synthetics. Uh, my bottles, when I mix it all, it's three bucks an ounce, and my bottles are all twenty five ounce spray bottles. Last you a whole season. Okay. Forehead and ground mix. So I have the urine for the ground mm -hmm. and I've got the forehead for the licking branch. Really nice, big spray bottles. Uh, I like them because they go just putting them on. You can mist, get more out of your scent and they're just a lot easier to, I don't know, to use. And if a guy wants to distribute them into smaller little containers, you could, but I definitely recommend no matter where you get this stuff, mist it. Get a get more uh, surface area covered on the dirt and in your licking branches, and if you just pour it, you're not going to get much surface area spread out. So I, I like getting that scent out. So you like I to mist. The, you like to moisten the, all the dirt, then kind of make it all wet. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. If you guys, if anybody gets on my Instagram, all they have to do is look at my reels. Okay. And you'll see me working my spray bottles on the dirt and on the licking branches. Okay. Yeah, and yeah. I, you're, I'm really looking for cover and surface area so I get more scent out into the wind currents. 
And I go real high on the initial build with my liking. Uh, I missed even above the liking branches just to get the scent out. It's all about contact scent to their nose. Just like, just like if you're trying to get a bear to come into a bait, you're using scent to get to that animal to bring them in. Same thing. You want to get that scent high in the wind, in the thermals, and get it out. Well, um, I appreciate you coming on and taking the time, Troy. I definitely learned uh, quite a bit, and I'm sure people listening are going to learn. Like I said, I had never – I'd always put scrapes where I thought deer were going to be, but I never really thought about the scent cone. So, I mean, seems – kind of silly to overlook but it's it's overlooked and i'm sure there's other guys like me so um you got to put it in their face you got to get it to their nose and then uh, don't forget don't forget the visual either building them you know i've had a lot of guys say troy you know i've had guys come to my boot camps i teach boot camps out west montana mm -hmm. and idaho they'll come to my all day whitetail boot camp and they'll say troy i listened to every podcast i watched your YouTube, but I didn't take your details seriously on building scrapes. And then I take them out in the woods here and I show them how I build one and I show them the detail and then they'll go do it on their own after the boot camp. They'll get back to me and say, if I'd have paid attention to detail, kept my human scent out of it, now I got bucks all over it. Hmm. So there is a lot of detail oriented stuff too that's hard to just talk about. You kind of got to yeah. see it. Well, uh, I won't keep you too much longer. Um, I'm not sure how late it is there, but it's almost 11:30 here. I got to get up early for work. So, um, again, I, I appreciate you coming on. I know you had another show you had to do earlier, and you're probably getting a dry throat from talking so much. But um, it's been it's been really fun, and uh, I hope to catch up with you soon. I'm gonna try try some of your tactics this year, and um, I'm I'm gonna order some of that stuff and try it in some scrapes. I'm really intrigued by it now I, I got i think maybe i kind of was always rubbed wrong by synthetics i kind of always thought it would be better to get the real thing but um hearing a guy that uses it and obviously has uh, a lot of su success with it i i want to give it a shot so um i thank you again sir you bet i don't think you'll i don't think you'll be uh i think you'll be pretty happy you give that stuff a try if you put it if you can locate it strategically and get it pushing into bedding areas you're going to be surprised what it elicits yeah thanks for having me adam yes sir um you have a good night all right take care